And uh, Brad, how many years did you play with the Bills? I was with them for three years. Super Bowl 91, 96, 90? 20, yeah, 91, 92, 93. Okay. And then did you play anywhere else after that? I went to Green Bay, and that's where I blew my knee out and retired. Got it. Okay. Uh, all right. I, I set out in 94, and I went to Green Bay in 95. Did they win the Super Bowl? Oh, no, Dallas won 95. No, what, Green Bay won in 96? The, they won in 96 when BB went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, BB's coming on next week, I, you think. And yeah, Brad, you're we got you on the docket, but you got a you, you got a you got a story to tell that we don't want to rush. You just did a story, Josh, an episode we haven't released yet, where he was on the staff in two thousand, uh, two thousand the year two thousand. Okay. And uh, working the sidelines for Tennessee at, for it was the year after the home run throwback game, and he. Oh, okay. Spoiler alert: We're gonna have it out this week, but he tripped at the end. Right, he was right behind Wade Phillips, and. Uh, <laughs> So we it's on YouTube. We were going to show it, but he was talking about how the game was VCR'd. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, they, they well, caught they, those... ESPN caught me on the sideline, Brad. It was it was quite a it was quite a moment. It was awful. Yeah, face, a face great. plant. He it. got up like nothing happened. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so Chris, we have Brad Lamb in here who played for the Bills in, uh, three years in the '90s, and he and Don are real good friends. How's it going, Brad? Hey, Brad Thanks Lamb. for joining. Thanks, Chris. How you doing, buddy? Oh, I'm doing good. Hey, hey, Brad. <laughs> since we're playing the Jets this week, and this is up to you, but uh, I remember you you played against them on a Monday night. Isn't that when, if you want to share, when uh, you were designated as having a an injury? Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story. You tell it with such humility. <laughs> we'll think about it. Yeah, it's a good one. If we, so, I, yeah. so I got to talk about when I missed the pass uh, when we were driving down the score to win the game, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you. It's, it's oh yeah, let's hear that story. Relevant. You know what? We only we only have seven people in here right now, Brad. So this is a safe time to tell it. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it was uh, it was cold when we were playing there on Monday night. My father in law was the first game he'd ever come to to watch me play in the NFL and. And James came out of the game. It was in the fourth quarter. I think we were down three Lofted. or somewhere around that. And we had to go down to score. And I, I, I'm thinking there was maybe two, three minutes left in the game. He came out. I went in for one play. Hadn't been in on offense the whole game. Just playing special teams. And and uh, Jim called called the play. And uh, it was a deep in route, 18-yard in route for me. Probably ran the best route of my life. I uh, got to DB, fell down. Ball's coming right to me. Splits my hands right through the through my hands and uh so i go to the sideline <clears throat> next day i go in to, to meet with marvin he says uh by the way you got a uh you got a uh, oblique injury so we're, we're putting you on ir ouch oh wow <laughs> so we're in the we're in the meeting room uh watching film and uh of course i know this play's coming up oh. And I'm sitting there slouching down in a chair because it's it, this is the meeting room where the whole offense is in, and it. it's not the breakdown meetings; it's the whole offense. And that play comes up, and it happens. And Jim Kelly goes, "I R, I R." That's when, 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 when's the next? When's the next time that you got a ball in the game? Uh, it wasn't until the playoffs. Uh, they brought me back for the playoffs, and uh, I, so I set out for the next uh, four to five games. Cold. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was rough. <laughs> it was rough. Wow, can you also maybe share the story that Don told me about the AFC Championship game in Miami when uh, you got called into duty and, and ran that reverse? Oh yeah, yeah, it uh, it was <laughs> that was that was actually a highlight, one of my highlights of my career. I loved playing in Joe Robbie Stadium back then; had some of my best games there. But um, yeah, they called me in there. Uh, Andre came out. He was uh, needing a break. So I went in, and uh, they called the reverse. And after it, it happened, and, and I think I think we got about 18 yards and got the first down. But uh, Marv Levy said, I didn't know Brad Lane was in there. If I didn't know he was in there, I wouldn't have called that play. Oh. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> that was redemption, though, Brad. I mean, so Jim's thinking 83 is coming around, and but it's 81, but he still he still goes through with the play. Like I said, you got 18 yards in, a, in the AFC Championship game. That's great. That's right. That's right. And uh, it was uh, it was great. Brian Cox, I think it was Brian, I think has his first name. Cox was playing for the Dolphins then, and he had broke through the line and, uh, you know, almost had me in the backfield. So uh, thank God it all worked out well. Yeah. So as we have uh, you know some more people joining us here, 
uh, kind of the point of today was to, you know, talk about, you know, how the Bills are back on top of the AFC and the number one seed and, and kind of share some stories about, about that and you know, maybe talk a little bit of Odell Beckham Jr. And, you know, we, uh, Brad Lamb was uh, nice enough to join us who played, uh, you know, three years with the Bills during the Super Bowl years. So I guess a question here for Don and maybe, you know, also for Brad, what do you think happened uh, on the visit? When, you know, Odell came here, the high profile visit and, you know, Don, I know we talked about this the other day on our podcast. Could you kind of just walk everybody through real quick what it's like to bring a high profile free agent to Buffalo? Well, uh, yeah. And, and this is without uh, I haven't I haven't spoke to, spoken to the folks I know over there to, to know exactly what happened. So this is speculation, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Um, and, you know, the with a high profile like guy like that, he certainly qualifies to, to be that. Um, you know, usually the private jet comes into play or, you know, at the, at the very least a first class ticket, um, you know, to get them into town. And, and it, it's pretty much an all hands on deck situation uh, for, for everyone in the building to know that, you know, it's essentially a recruiting trip. Um, former VP uh, <clears throat> of pro personnel under Tom Donahoe, John Guy, used to tell the stadium operations department literally to do a white glove test on, on the stairway rails and everything. Um, <clears throat> the lobby was, it had to be perfect, but uh, you know, the thing with, with OBJ is, you know, famously he, he is coming back from an ACL uh, injury and we had Marlon Kerner on our show last week and I'm, I'm getting some great feedback about him talking about recovering uh, from an ACL tear coming back too early you know, he, he tried to come back in 10 months uh, when it's really a 12-month injury. So, you know, Beckham, of course, got hurt in the Super Bowl. So that's he's sort of in that 10-month uh, window still. Um, so it, it, the, the medical team is, is going to be uh, essential for this. They're going to really want to do their homework. I don't know if they worked him out in shorts or not, but they certainly took a, you know, take a good look at the knee. But um, they don't want to make too big a deal of that either. They, they really want to... Uh, make sure that um, he's treated in, in such a way that, uh, you know, he knows he's, he's more than welcome. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the thing that he, he's being shown a red carpet treatment. And, uh, you know, I, I'll be talking to some folks over there to see how it went, but right now that, <clears throat> you, that that's how it goes for sure. So, so Brad, let me ask you a question. We were talking uh, in the podcast, in, in the in the Twitter Spaces last night. Uh, you know, a guy like you. You know, let's say you're third, fourth, fifth on the depth chart. There, what do you think those guys are feeling right now? Whether it's like Khalil Shakir or one of those guys, when there's like a high profile push to get a guy who might take your spot. Like, how does that feel? Like, did you encounter that? Like, like what's the vibe in the locker room? Well, yeah, you def you definitely feel it. I mean, but at the same time, you know what makes any great football team is you want to win and whatever it takes to win. And if this person is going to come in and, and help the team win or get to the ultimate goal, which is to win the championship and the Super Bowl, then you know you've got to put some of that personal feeling aside and know it's also a business decision. Uh, but at the same time, as being a professional athlete, it's like you know he's a great athlete, but I'm going to compete with him. It doesn't mean he's going to come in here and take my job. I'm still going to compete and, and work hard. But, you know, if the chips fall where they may and, and he's better than I am and he gets out there and he helps our team, then that's what we got to deal with. Yeah, that's – that can I, – I, I, were there ever any kind of awkward situations or times that you can remember where a guy, you know, really wasn't welcoming to a, to a guy that was going to take his spot? I don't, I don't remember anything as, as far as being really unwelcoming. Uh, obviously, uh, we're all athletes and, and we all believe uh, we're good athletes and that competition sets in. So uh, I, I think it comes down to, your, to the character of the person. Um, you know, in your mind, your reality, you know, you know whether or not someone's better than you are. And, but at the same time, you also know if you're better than they are. And then sometimes it just comes down to a coaching decision. If that player fits better in the, in the mold with everybody else than, than the other person. So, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into that and uh, you know, you, you deal with it as it comes and, and, you know, you try to you try to put the best foot forward each and every day and you give it your hundred percent and you can only control 
what you can control. And it's what I tell my son all the time is that you can't control everybody else, but you can control what you do and how you perform and how you act and how you prepare. Uh, Brad, are you following the, uh, the current bills? How closely would you say you follow the current team? I say I follow them really close, and so is my whole family. I've got uh, six kids, so every single one of my daughters, which I got five daughters and one son, uh, all huge fans of Buffalo, and uh, uh, we we stay on top of them pretty close. Now I'm curious the um, the the culture of the the current team is pretty front and center. Um, I'm I'm curious from your perspective, uh, how is it similar or different from the culture around the team that you played on? Uh, Don and I actually talked about this uh, not too long ago, but but I think it's very similar. You know, I, I love seeing, you know, Diggs and Josh and, and the guys just hanging out, spending time together, not only at the at the football field, but off the football field and the family culture that it, that it felt like, which is the way I felt when I was in Buffalo. And, and I think that's what it takes for a team to be successful. You know, I look at it in life and marriage and everything else. You got your ups and downs. You know, what's going to bring you through that? It's going to be, you know, your, your, your teammate playing through those injuries and playing through those tough times so you can be, uh, be there for your teammates and, and bring, them, bring them up when they're down and they can bring you up when you're down. And I think that family atmosphere is what you got to have to be successful. And I think Buffalo has that in these guys. Uh, they went through that little rough spell, but, you know, these last few games on the road, uh, it's been, you know, it's been exciting to watch. Um, you know, I think they've probably taken a few more years off of, of my life, but, uh, you know, <laughs> it, at the same time, it's exciting to see how Josh has grown and, and the premier quarterback that he is, uh, and, and the players that just want to, who wouldn't want to, want to play around as a receiver. That's what I tell everybody, you know, I'd run through a wall for Jim Kelly cause I love the man. And I think his receivers, his running backs, his linemen, uh, feel the same way about Josh that they would do whatever they can do. Uh, to help that team win, and uh, I think that's a great, great uh, uh, thing to have in that team. Don, you, know, you shared something. You shared something with me yesterday, Don, and maybe you, know, you and Brad could kind of both talk about this as well. Uh, you know, there's the myth that the players are always looking, you know, one game at a time. And you know, you said to me, Don, obviously yesterday with the way that the AFC uh, games all broke, the Bills are back in the one seed. Maybe you could just share what you said to me yesterday about you know the building and and the players and the staff, and obviously Brad might have have a, a story as well about you know knowing where you are in the standings and maybe the whole take one game at a time is a little bit more of a myth well it, it's not it's not mutually exclusive it's not one lane uh you know you it you're standing uh, you know where, where the team stands is dependent whether you like it or not on um on scoreboard watching and i mean yesterday was a dream situation for the bills but it doesn't end there i mean yeah they they're they're in a position now <clears throat> to um they're in the driver's seat they they can control their own destiny but um, you still have to look around the league and see who's hanging with you. And so internally, yeah, it, it's a line that the, the PR staff tells every coach and player to say, you know, one game at a time. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Brad can attest too. You, you, you do pay attention to what the other teams are doing. Just to, you, you want to know, uh, where you're likely to end up in the seatings and, um, and, and they matter. Another thing too, going back to Brad's point about the family atmosphere, one of the, one of the, uh, stories in the league that I find actually very surprising. Um, uh, it was Russell Wilson and, you know, he had a birthday party, but only half the team responded. I, I, Brad, could you ever rem- imagine if Jim Kelly had a party? And I mean, you know, uh, you guys were all in to support him as you just kind of mentioned before. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I remember my wife even had a birthday party for me there and, uh, I, I don't know if I had half the team show up, but I had, I had quite a few people just coming coming over to my house to to wish me happy birthday. You know, out receivers and you know with Tasker and Metzlars and those guys. You know, so uh, you know that family atmosphere is uh, is huge. And a funny story is when you're not funny, but when you're when you're talking about you know if you look at one game at a time. I remember when the meeting rooms um, we knew. Uh, especially, uh, and, and now I'm talking about just in specialty rooms like a wide receiver room, when we were going to play certain teams, you know, we were getting ready to play uh, back then with Rod Woodson against the Steelers and, you know, against the De- Denver, you know, we'd come in and we say, okay, you know, you, you, you barrel down because you know you're getting ready to get into a, a real fight with these these DBs. They're going to they're gonna knock you for a loop. And I remember the first coach that we had was uh, Nick Nicolau, 
and uh, he was my first receiver coach there in Buffalo. And during the playoffs, he would he would come in and he said, "All right, this is this is the time when you don't talk to your wife and you kick your dog." And <laughs> he was he was being as serious as art <laughs> thing. I mean, he Ooh. meant it. In other words, nothing else matters right now. This is it. This is your life and uh don't let anything distract you and uh you know so there's some uh, there's some things there but yeah you, you know now at this point in time they they're in the driver's seat you know each game that you're getting ready to play uh is it i mean they know if we went we win each game take one to time you know we're, we're going to be where we want to be and what we started out to do for this season Nick Nicolau should have included or get in a fight with your offensive line coach. <laughs> <laughs> For those well, who don't know that well, that story, was the last year. Right? Next year we got Charlie Joyner. So. <laughs> oh, okay. They, they, uh, so it was Tom Bresnahan was – was he the offensive coordinator or the offensive line coach? Either way, he's still on the line staff. Line coach, yeah. And, um, yeah, and uh, apparently they got in a fight in one of their offices so heated that it got physical to the point of Nick Nicolau, who was like – Two thirds the size of Tom Bresnahan, <laughs> putting him in a headlock and putting his head through into a wall. <laughs> it broke the drywall, Jeez. and then Tom Bresnahan had a a um, like a bruiser or something on his face to cover up the wound that they had to edit out of the team picture. Oh, <laughs> so it got heated. <laughs> anyway, that- oh, crazy. <laughs> For anyone anyone who's just joining us, we're talking with. Uh, Josh Cormier, a former coaching assistant for the Bills, and Don Purdy, who for 13 years was the director of football administration for the Bills, and special guest Brad Lamb, who was a receiver uh, during the Jim Kelly era. If anybody in here has a question they want to ask, feel free to request to speak. Um, But thank you for joining. And, uh, yeah, um, Don, we had some, some talk in the... Uh, spaces last night about you know the OBJ visit and you uh, I heard that you have dealt with his agent in the past is that true well to the extent of uh, he represented some rookie free agents uh, it was my job at the end of a draft um, the, the what you know you, you get seven to ten players depending on how many draft picks you had but you still had about 15 to 19 to 20 roster spots to fill out the, the roster to get to 90. Um, so the coaches and scouts uh, starting right around the, the beginning of the seventh round would start to make calls to guys who it appeared weren't going to be drafted and they would <clears throat> have parameters set, <clears throat> excuse me, as a class A, B, C, or D um, in terms of how much they would get for uh a signing bonus, the contract would be all the same, you know, a three or four year, year deal, a rookie deal. But um, he was, <clears throat> he was one of the agents. So they, they would give the, the agreement to me. It wasn't a contract, but it was supposed to be as good as a contract um, until the contract actually came through. But um, yeah, he represented some players and I had to send those agreements to all of the agents who had verbal agreements to say, yeah, my guy, I'll sign with you. And of course the, Coaches and scouts would tell these guys, oh, we, we think you have a real chance to make a roster, which in reality was a long shot. I mean, there were very few Jason Peters out there or, um, you know, Jabari Greers or guys that really did make the roster as an undrafted player. But it was it was my responsibility that night to ensure that I got a signed agreement back um, from every agent that their player would report five, four or five days later for rookie camp. And I remember him being one of them. A lot of guys were um, real thorough about it. A lot of guys were real loose, but you know, we didn't want them, you know, cause other teams, we knew we were competing with other teams for these guys. So um, yeah, Zeke was one of those guys. I think he had, a, he had an NBA background, but I had some interaction with him uh, over the course of the years. Uh, so him, him representing uh, OBJ <laughs> is uh, is a big deal, and and uh, so yeah, that was that was about the extent of my interaction with, with him. But uh, you know, it, it was it was something. Do you mean it's a big deal in the sense that OBJ is a particularly big client on his list? Oh yeah, no, I mean yeah, he's he's a premier player. I mean, any agent who really they're not profitable until they're able to secure a second contract for a player. Um, They're almost working at a deficit. Um, They're working other jobs. They're usually lawyers. Uh, But um, when they finally get um, a player a second contract, that's when they actually become profitable as an agent. 
Um, there's a local agent here, a friend of mine that interned for me and he had, uh, um, Taysom Hill and, you know, Taysom Hill is obviously a very different type of player. You can't put him into a box really. And right be- he had been working with the saints to get him, you know, a second contract. It would have been this particular agent's first second contract, and he was real excited. And, and just like in, in the uh, Tom Cruise movie, there, uh, it got he changed his mind right before doing that, and it, it was devastating to him. But he's still plugging along and doing real well and increasing his clientele uh, every year. And he's, I think, he's about to get that first second contract. So oh, he got he got Jerry Maguire, huh? Was he got Jerry Maguire. Yeah, that's a good way to <laughs> yeah. put it. Oh, that's man, what that's... I was trying to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just like the that's movie. Yeah. Tough. That's tough. I, I see that we have uh, a listener, EB, who uh, requested to speak. I don't know if you have a question or, or a comment, EB. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, comment and then my question. Comment is, you guys can hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, we won three straight coin tosses. Um, we've won <laughs> three straight games. Just going to put that out there. That's great. <laughs> um, my question, Brad, first of all, uh, Chris, Don, this is really cool. I'm, I'm stopping my work. This is great. Thank you. Qu- question for Brad. Um, I was a teenager in the 90s, so give me some, give the listeners some behind the scenes of like 92, 93. Like what would we see on social media if you guys had that back then? Like something behind the scenes that we might like. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Great question. <clears throat> that is a good question. Because uh, back then, uh, cell phones were just starting to come out so the one i had was about half the size of my head so <laughs> it was a little different time and, and place but um i, I don't know how it w- I, I think it would be very different in, in the in the regards that social me- social media now is is more it's almost to me self-promoting which is almost counterproductive for what you're trying to do as a team uh so for me personally uh, I probably wouldn't be on it that much uh, unless it was for, for positive things for our team. Uh, you know, I think now a lot of it's uh, for contract negotiations. It's for, you know, personal satisfaction and gratification. So, you know, I, th- I think it would be a little bit tamer then uh, than it is now, uh, at least in my perspective. Uh, as far as I'll tell you what, though, the person that would probably be the most fun uh, if he had a, a Twitter back then and all that would have been James Lofton. Uh, because James was a was a, a jokester and a, and, a, and a character there for us, great great friend of mine, great great person, great athlete. But I remember when we first we first uh, came in to, to meetings and and I was new there. Uh, James would always run out of the meeting room of our wide receiver meeting room, uh, or actually the the uh, group meeting for the offensive group, and he would run to the elevator and close it. So he could get up and be first in a wide receiver meeting and try to make everybody else late. You know, he, it's just the kind of person he was joking around and, and horsing around like that. But, but he would be the guy that would be on social media, probably stirring the things up for everybody. That's a finable offense being late. That's cold. <laughs> yeah, very much so. <laughs> That's funny. It surprised me a bit. Like, at, yeah. He'd be laughing as the door was shutting on you. That's great. Wow. You know, that's that's that, that's really funny. Is is there somebody who would who who would scare you on on social media from back then, Brad? Like, you know, God love him. We had Daryl Talley on a couple weeks ago. I feel like maybe '90s <laughs> Daryl Talley would have been a little bit of a loose cannon. Yeah, you just took the words out of my mouth. That was the first per- <laughs> first person that popped in my mind that uh, he probably would say whatever he was thinking, and he'd put it right out there. Um, but you know, that was what was so cool about about that group in the, in the '90s. Man, we had such a great bunch of guys with different personalities and backgrounds that all come together and just cared about each other. And, and, you know, and I think that goes to test even now when, when everybody gets together, it's just like, you know, we haven't been away from each other for 20 years, but it seems like it was just yesterday and, and the guys are, are great. And uh, I love that, love those teams back then. And, and I think that's what we got now. That's what I keep hearing from over there too. One of the, another point about social media from the question was I, I became good friends with player engagement directors at the Bills, um, you know, during social media. And I just remember, you know, being in the office of a Paul Lancaster and and somebody coming to him is like, oh my gosh, did you see what Leotis McKelvin posted last night at 3 a.m.? And he's like, oh, I'll talk to him and tell him not to do that. But you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. And to the extent that the team wants to try to put out some kind of consistent message, which is nearly impossible, 
uh, you know, social media, while it has its um, uh, things, things that are positive about it, it, it also is a, a you know, a landmine at two. So, so Brad, we, uh, we hear a lot about Josh Allen's new house and how he's hosting players there. And we've all heard that back in the day, Jim Kelly's house was the place to be. Any, any stories you can tell us about uh, hanging out at Jim's place? Um, I'll probably have to plead the fifth on that. <laughs> no, now overall, I mean that that's what I think is is so cool about the the two teams that we're talking about and the two eras is you know again Jim Kelly, the leader of the team, uh, inviting everybody over to his house to hang out after after a game and a win and uh, just building that camaraderie off the field, not just you know not just at the football stadium and and why we're there you know, practicing, it was, you know, what, we're family, we care about each other on and off the field, and, and that's what's so cool about it. And I think that's why I still have such a, a loving and, and fond memory of my times in Buffalo, and, and of course, Bill's Mafia, I mean, what, what it went to Green Bay, but Green Bay holds nothing on, on the Buffalo Bills fans and the Bills Mafia. I mean, it was a place that, uh, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that I had, you know, my whole family back here, uh, I would probably stayed in Buffalo and uh, and live there because I, we my wife and I loved it so much and our first child was born there and uh, you know we uh, we just we just loved it. Do you, um, Brad? Can you kind of explain like having the franchise quarterback, you know, Josh Allen, Jim Kelly, like like how is the team dynamic different if you know there is not an established franchise quarterback? Well, I think it goes to the same. It just goes to the, the to the leader and the leadership of, of your team. Um, and when you have when you have those, and, and I said it all along, when when we were going through the quarterbacks after after the nines after Jim, I said you know until till we get another Jim Kelly, which is going to be far and few between, uh, you know it, it's it's going to be it's going to be hard. And uh, when we got Josh Allen in there, you know. You know, I know everybody was was worried that first year, but I was telling everybody then what I seen from him is, you know, a tough kid, loved to play the game. And when you got somebody like that that just thoroughly just loves to play the game, he brings everybody up up to that level. Jim was the same way. Jim wasn't going to come out of a football game, and sometimes even to his detriment when he was hurt and probably should have come out of the game. If he didn't want to come out of the game, <laughs> he wasn't coming out. But that's also the kind of kind of guy you want to play for and you want to be around. That's the guy you want to – rally behind as your leader for your football team and that and that's what josh does for this team now i believe and uh, so i think uh good lord willing he stays healthy uh they've got a great future for many many years ahead don we were uh, we were talking last night in in the twitter spaces about contracts and all and maybe chris can help me remember uh which like kind of unique clauses uh and w- w- is there a clause in a contract that says that a uh, a player can't like shovel or snowblow or like ride a motorcycle. Yeah. We, we were just, we were just, and, and we were kind of discussing those fun. Chris, Chris, what, what were some of the ones we were talking about? Yeah. So, um, cover one contributor, Kevin Baseri was, uh, was telling us how he, um, had a contact who was a professional Christmas decoration, um, installer in the Buffalo area. And this is where he heard this was that, you know, because uh, this guy had done work, I guess, with um, for some of the players, and uh, that the Bills players are contractually um, barred from shoveling snow and from installing Christmas lights on their house uh, for fear of hurting themselves, which I think makes a lot makes logical sense. But what we were trying to figure out, I mean, obviously, we had this big storm in Buffalo a couple weeks ago, and uh, there was there were, you know, videos of, of players shoveling on social media. You have to figure that that was sort of an extenuating circumstance with such a big storm. But uh, we were kind of curious, you know, what happens um, if the team finds out that a player is doing something like that, that they're not supposed to do. And, you know, what are their repercussions? Um, so, yeah, I was curious to know if you've ever had to deal with any of that. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a great question. Um, those two that you just mentioned shoveling and putting up Christmas lights are new since I was there last in 2017, but, uh, every year it's called a signing bonus forfeiture clause, meaning that, uh, it's up to the team discretion. If they're shown, if they're shown or told that a player is performing one of those activities, uh, like previous to Ben Roethlisberger, 
uh, riding a motorcycle, believe it or not, was not on there. But then when he got in his motorcycle accident, everyone added that to their forfeiture clause. Anytime there was a news of a player getting injured doing something, you know, not for not foreseen or not thought of, they would add that to the signing bonus forfeiture clause. It's it's up to the team's discretion as to whether or not. Put it this way: if if they're not actually if they're caught doing one of those activities but not injured. Um, the team doesn't have much of a leg to stand on because the union and the agents who work hand in hand will say, look, he wasn't injured. So, you know, you could try to find him. We're going to fight that, but you certainly can't take any of his uh, prorated remaining portion of the signing bonus that he would have to pay back because they get that money. Um, and it's, it's full errand to think it's, you know, most of it's still there and, and, pay backable but it, it, it is a real thing if a player is injured doing something that they signed their contract saying that they wouldn't do um, the team does have the upper hand to recoup a portion of of their signing bonus or roster bonus or or whatever it is the, the, and uh so it, it, it is a real thing but i i i was surprised to find out that putting up Christmas lights and shoveling um, were, were added to that. So, uh, I mean, if you, th- if you think about the, the shoveling piece though, I, I mean, I could totally, I can totally understand how yeah. there's all sorts of injuries you can, you can get from doing that. Um, yeah. Even straining your lower back or it puts you in a position of maybe being on the street and you getting clipped. But I mean, I, I can attest personally, from the storm we had a couple of weeks ago, it's bizarre to look out the window now and it's essentially gone. But uh, man, my lower back was 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 killing me. Now I'm far from a pro athlete, but uh, I I remember talking to my neighbors and and other folks saying, "Oh, my lower back for two days." I could, so I mean that would certainly uh, could um, be a detriment to a, a you know a player being ready for a game. Brad, can we bring you in on this? Was there anything that uh, that you weren't supposed to do when you were when you were playing that you that you missed? Um, I, I don't remember not being one of the things that was in my one of my contract was I couldn't go skydiving, which they didn't have to worry about that. I wasn't going to do that anyway, but uh, that that was one of. Them. <laughs> but, I saw know, that one. I I can understand why some of that stuff goes in because I was I was doing some wiring at my house. And had a razor blade knife out stripping some wire and, and cut my thumb open and had to have three stitches uh, on my right hand. And that affected me catching, obviously catching the ball for about a week there while that was healing up. Uh, and then uh, my wife and I did some scuba diving lessons. That wasn't in my contract that I couldn't scuba dive. I ended up getting an ear infection, throwing my equilibrium off. Luckily, it was in the off season, so I had time to heal that up. But, but there's that no- is in there now. Scuba diving is in there now when I was there. That was added to it. So <laughs> I, I can understand that. I mean, it's uh, there's a, there's reasons behind. Sometimes you know people think, oh, they just throw that stuff in there, but there's there's probably a reason why they've added it, <laughs> and there's reasons why they've got those things in there. Um, you know, some of the uh, some of the players, uh, you know, I, how do I say this nicely? Um, I, well, I guess you think you're invincible and you can do what you, know, you can do whatever you you want to do, and, and you're going to be fine. Uh, so, you know, I think some of those are probably, uh, smart things to have in those contracts. That's uh, that's great. Uh, we have a, another listener who, uh, I think wants to make a comment or a question, the real underdog. Yes. How y'all doing this morning, guys? We're good. How are you? I'm great. All right. Uh, go Bill. Um, yes, sir. I, I have a question. Um, with the news of Baker, Me- Baker Mayfield, um, about to be released by the Panthers. Do you guys think it will make any sense um, for the Bills to try and pick him up as a backup? Mm. That, that, that's that's an interesting one. You know, I, I, I Baker Baker obviously has a, a good pedigree, and you know, it, probably not very well thought of in the league <laughs> anymore. I wonder if San Francisco might be an option for him with uh, you know Don's long lost cousin Brock Purdy uh, <laughs> now slated to yeah. be the starter there because uh, you know Jimmy G being out for the year. Uh, I would think you know most likely I, I would think San Francisco would be a landing place like that. Brad, like a, a guy like Baker Mayfield, who number one overall, you know, obviously it hasn't worked out in two stops. Do you feel like a guy like that is just going to continue to get chances, you know, for the next? three, four, five years. Interesting note here too, Brad is uh, calling us from Charlotte. Oh yeah, there you go, Brad. Give us, give us your thoughts there if you could. Yeah. Um, 
it, it's, I'll be honest with you, it's kind of hard for me because that's one of the positions I like to watch and, and try to evaluate the quarterbacks in the league. And we've got some great ones in there right now that, that are fun to watch. Um, and, and I've noticed down here with, with Baker, with, with the Panthers, is he gets a lot of batted balls down. And I don't know if it's his height or, or if he just can't get in those throwing lanes like some of these other guys can do or what. I think his, his tenure is probably about – come up I, I don't know he might get chances as backup I, I think as far as being a starting quarterback in this league I think he's probably exhausted most of those avenues at this point in my in my opinion um seems like a great competitor a, a great guy but you know when it's all said and done you gotta get you gotta get it done on the field on, on Sundays and it just seems like he's just having a hard time doing that uh in two different locations now so I think he's probably got an opportunity to be a backup in, in the league if he so chooses uh, to continue to, to go down that path. But as far as a, a starting QB, um, that, that's interesting, though, with, with the 49ers. I, you know, that could be could be a good spot for him. And sometimes it's just the it's just uh, the luck of the draw. You can you can fall into a great situation and, and things can turn around for you. So maybe that maybe that'll happen for him. Baker is a better commercial star than he is a quarterback, I'm afraid. <laughs> but uh, I do, I do kind of miss the commercials, if I'm being honest. <laughs> yeah, this is a boring point, but I think it's, it's really, in my opinion, wouldn't make sense for the Bills at all in 2022 with Case Keenum being a uh, more than viable backup, having been a starter. I mean, Frank Reich proved to be uh, the ultimate backup, and he had hardly any you know, starting experience, um, you know, save for Jim Kelly injuries, but he was great in the film room. And uh, I I, I kind of pegged, without knowing him, pegged Keenum to be that kind of backup that uh, that supports Josh and 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 wouldn't be, you know, a disruption at, at all, like Baker might. Can we talk about Frank Reich for, for a minute? I mean, how do you guys feel about the end of his tenure in Indianapolis? I thought it was ridiculous. I mean, not just, not just, I, Brad knows them better than I do, but, um, I mean, what, they were three, four, and one, and they were traditionally slow starters. Uh, they were playing in a weak division. And, um, when I was let go from the Bills in 2017, I, I was on a, a, uh, had a company that we had a platform that NFL teams were using, and the Eagles were one of them. And I visited them a few times, and Frank was the offensive coordinator there. And he was beloved in Philadelphia. Absolutely just thought, uh, you know, and he, of course, won a Super Bowl, which is which is awesome. But, um, yeah, he, he's, he's a very – one of those players that Brad talks about in terms of the highest character. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll turn it over to Brad. But that's my, my initial thought about it. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you, Don. He um... – he was what a, a great person, great teammate, great football player, great mind. Um, and I, and I kind of was shocked, uh, when they let him go as well. Um, I think they didn't give him that full, you know, the full range to be able to do what he needed to do there and, and kind of cut him short. But, you know, I don't know where the decisions with the QBs were, were made in that organization over the this last few years where they've had their struggles, um, you know, at that position, uh, but obviously, I, I think that's where most of it lies. Is they they've got to get them a, a franchise quarterback there to to be able to move forward. And and uh, you know, I think Frank played with what he had. And you know, some people probably said, uh, you know, he should have drafted that quarterback. But I think a lot of people don't understand the head coach don't always get the final say so and and who they get. Um, so you know, I don't know where that falls. So it's hard to say. You know where you know where you can place that blame on on him or not. But um, you know, I thought I thought it was sad that they uh, they let him go that way. Is there anything to the fact that the Colts have about eight million dollars in cap space? I mean, is there an argument there that the front office, the owner um, Jim Irsay, wasn't uh, you know investing enough into talent on the team, or is that a fairly normal amount to to keep on hand? Um, I'll be honest with you. That might be more of Don' question on that. I, I don't know uh, as far as on that salary cap uh, side of it uh, as, as much, but I would think 
if you were struggling at that position and you had money, you'd be doing everything you could do to to get somebody in there that uh, could help you win football games. He's he's Robert Ursay's a loose cannon, huh? I mean, the idea <laughs> of the I mean that that's an understatement, right? Like the idea of bringing in Jeff Saturday on its face was was ridiculous. Letting Frank go after you know basically subjecting him to that carousel of of one year quarterbacks was seemed patently unfair. And yeah, Don, I mean. It, Usually, what what does a team carry? You know, between five and, and five and eight million dollars a year during the year. Uh, you mean a salary cap room? Yeah. Yep. I mean, uh, they, ideally, uh, you know, teams that that uh, that feel like they're right there. <clears throat> what what the Bills? I, I, they're doing a masterful job. I'm, I'm sorry, it's super crap. I'm just laughing really hard at a a comment that a Lauren wrote here. I should have written those clauses into a marriage contract before getting married. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's hilarious. But shout out to Lauren. She is always hilarious. That's good stuff. Um, but uh, the bills, and this is, this is a good thing, but you pay a price for it. Uh, when they, when most teams will have uh, player incentives that um, will say, okay, if a player gets five or more interceptions, Greg talked about this last night and they haven't, in ways to be likely to be earned or not, depending on what they did in the previous season. But they'll, they'll often couple, uh, you know, X number of rushing yards, receiving yards for their respective positions, but they'll couple it with, and the bills make the playoffs. So during the playoff drought, a lot of players achieved those, you know, some of the great, the great players and, um, they like Josh mentioned, Eric molds. And then you got you know, guys right through the years, Takeo spikes got X number of tackles, but, if the team didn't make the playoffs. Uh, they signed the contract saying that they didn't, they they wouldn't uh, earn those incentives. But in the past few years, of course, the Bills are making the playoffs every year, so the team um, is taking a cap hit for that. And it, of course, they wouldn't trade it for anything. But it, it does make it a little more challenging. And now Josh not being on his rookie contract, you know. Talk to him next week. So, Brad, you remember Woody? Okay. Oh, yeah. Woody. Well, I'll make sure. Absolutely. You, how can you forget? How can you forget Woody? <laughs> uh, oh, my gosh. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good teaser for an interview. But <laughs> that's going to be uh, at the end of this week. Uh, wish, wish us luck. Wish us luck, Brad. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, good luck. I wish it now. Good luck. Uh, yeah, thanks. Oh, I think it'll be great. Um, but, uh, yeah, be. the, the – uh, you know, salary cap does become an issue. And I think when, when a team like the, the Colts have you know, they had Rivers and then Wentz and then it's like kind of the same guy, right, at the same point in their career, the twilight, hoping that they're good enough with the running game and the defense that a quarterback like that is, is just exactly what they need. So if they kind of bail on that formula and go to a rookie contract, it, it gives the fan base a, a, a message kind of like, hey, we're starting over, we're rebuilding, and no fan really wants to hear that. Even though it's true, even with Josh Allen coming in, as we talked about earlier in his first year, Brad mentioned he, he struggled. But, man, by year two, uh, you know, look historically, look at the Peyton Mannings and the, um, even, um, you know, some of the guys that in year two, after really understanding the speed of the game, like Marlon Kerner talked about last week, understanding, you know, get their, their bodies from – a college body into a, a man's body with thanks to guys like Rusty Jones. Um, man, they can, they can just be so much better in that second year, but that first year rarely are, are as they good, are they as good as maybe a luck when he came in, like, pardon the pun, but they were kind of lucky yeah. with him. There aren't too many guys that are that successful in their first year. Speaking of uh, Woody and the and the equipment, and the equipment room and the equipment manager, Brad, you got a good, uh, you got a good locker room story for us. Uh, well, <clears throat> Jerry Craft. Oh, you know, I like you that, don't one. Have to tell that one. You don't have to tell. <laughs> I can't. I can't tell. No, that story. <laughs> it's not that bad. It's just it's bad. Yeah, but don't worry. It, don't. Exactly, we're not it's labeling just, them. It's just not family friendly. That's for sure. <laughs> okay. uh, but yeah, I mean, Jerry. Uh, it was funny because you know Jerry, four hundred pounds. Uh, I remember. I think he was driving a Lincoln and. Uh, it was funny because you would you would go out there to the car and this is this is no joke. It literally looked like it was jacked up on the right side from where he would sit on the driver's side on the left side. That car would be tilted, literally tilted, with him sitting in it driving down the road. I mean, it, it, it was a sight. It was a sight to see. Uh, but I do remember, um, you know, when we were when we were playing Houston in the greatest comeback game, and uh, I was sitting beside Steve Christie was was one of my and Eddie Fuller went 
two side by side locker mates there in the locker room. And I remember at halftime we were sitting there and we were and uh, saying, you know, uh, Steve looked over at me and he said, "Man, it'd be a miracle if we win this game." <laughs> and uh, you know, I you know we started we chuckled out a little bit, but the the whole the whole thing that was said at halftime was, you know, obviously the first half we were embarrassed, but we weren't we weren't going to quit. Let's go out there and give it our best shot the second half, put a second half together and play and and hold our heads up and let the chips fall where they may. And of course, you know, everything fell into place and, you know, it worked out and we, we came back and won that game. So, um, you know, just uh, a lot of good, good memories in that locker room. I remember um, Kenny Davis, one of the, the crazy things about Kenny was he, the, the guy literally that we had a coffee pot that would sit right out in the middle of the locker room uh, every morning. And if he didn't drink at least 10 cups of black coffee in the morning before we went out on the, on the practice field and he didn't drink any, he, he drank black coffee like it was going out of style. I guess that's why he was so wow. wired all the time. You know, he, he was always wired up, but, uh, but yeah, just some, just some neat guys, neat memories, a lot, a lot of fun. 10 cups. Woo. At least. Yeah. <laughs> at least. Oh, wow. Okay. Then Brad, did you, uh, did you play on any special teams with Steve Tasker? I did. I was actually uh, the right gunner, and he was the left gunner. And uh, if you guys remember, I'm sure you do, when we played uh, the, the Rams. And Vernon Turner, who actually was the wide receiver in Buffalo, which they let go the year I was drafted, um, he was one of, the, one of the receivers that the Buffalo uh, cut and I was kept, was returning the uh, punt. And that's when Steve went down there, and as soon as he touched it, put his head right in his chest and knocked him off his feet uh, about five to seven yards back. Uh, I was the gunner on the other side. I hadn't quite got there yet. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, Steve was, my gosh, man. He was probably, you know, I, I had got clocked at a four two six forty speed. But Steve was probably the quickest – person i'd ever seen in my life is from side to side you know we used to in practice it was funny because none of the dbs would ever go against him one-on-one -on -one, uh because nobody would would put a hand on him he just he was just so elusive on that so quick and knew how to i mean you'd see two guys on him out there when he was doing punt returns and he'd get past both of them and sometimes not get touched i mean the guy was just phenomenal when it came to that and i i hope he does get into the hall of fame because i think he deserves it we, we talked to him a couple of weeks back, Brad, and I don't know if you heard that interview or not, but he said Jim Kelly was always pushing for him to be able to get more snaps on offense. And the year uh, where they had a couple of injuries and he came in in 95, he felt like Jim was kind of forcing him the ball in a way to kind of prove to the coaching staff and everybody, like, see, I told you about this guy for years, that he's you know a capable receiver and not just a special teams guy. Oh, absolutely. he said, yeah, he just wanted to be, Jim just wanted to be right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Steve, Steve benched 450 pounds. I mean, the guy was only, what was he? Five, five, 10, but and 185, 190 pounds, but he benched 450 pounds. The guy was a, was a monster and strong as an ox, but, but yeah, he, uh, he was a great receiver as well. He, he didn't have, I wouldn't say the, just the flat out 40 speed, but he was going to, he would get open. You know, if you, if you put him on a one-on-one -on -one coverage with anybody at any time in a game, I, I think you could count on him getting open. So uh, I, I definitely think Jim was probably right that he probably deserved, you know, more snaps. But, you know, if you're playing in that slot position, you got Andre Reid, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, plus when you're so valuable as a special teamer, uh, it's, you know, it's hard to, to risk that, right? If, he, if, you're, uh, if, you're being, if you're on the field more on offense – uh, because if he gets hurt, that's a that's a, a big loss to the special teams unit. Oh, Chris, that's such a testament to him because the, usually the theory is the opposite. Teams are are hesitant to put starting position players on special teams, but that's just how great he was at special teams that they were hesitant to make him a position player just because of how valuable he he was there. Yeah, it's uh, it seems like the the current regime has shown a propensity for uh, protecting their return specialists. For example, you, you know, you saw Andre Roberts never played on offense. And, um, you know, I think clear Khalil Shakir, when he was m playing more of a return role, he wasn't getting a lot of snaps. And then now he, maybe he's getting on the field more that, uh, that Heinz has taken over that role. So it's kind of interesting to see that. Brad, you, um, 
I, I, I remember sitting in Pasadena, Super Bowl 27 against the Cowboys, and you brought back a kick, man. I, I thought you had it. I think somebody just made a shoestring tackle on you, and you might have gone all the way. I'm sure, I'm sure you think about that. Yeah, I think how life might have changed <laughs> if I had ran out no, all the way back for a touchdown. And yeah, it's it's, it's vivid. I remember it was uh, it was it was me and the kicker really, and I slowed down uh, to make a cut back to the right to try to get by him because all I could see was daylight from that point. And I still remember the guy's name, Gant, uh, from uh, from Dallas, uh, mm-hmm. was coming in from the side and uh came in and, and nailed me and uh actually got a thigh bruise on that play and and wasn't able to come back in the game after that either but uh yeah i was uh i was looking for six on that one and was uh my eyes was as big as softballs thinking that was going to happen and then 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 it did <laughs> <laughs> we, got a, we got a couple a couple more minutes here so if anybody else wants to, to hop in with a comment or a question you know we'd welcome it uh you know brad i i, I was noticing the other day i think it was josh or, or one of the guys talking about how everybody's kind of banged up at this time of the year everybody's playing with an injury you know, maybe could you could you kind of talk about what it's like like the first week of december you know gate week 13 week 14 what what did your body feel like by then yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it's pretty beat up, you know, and I, and I wasn't the starter, so my body was probably a little bit better shaped than some of the other guys. But, uh, you know, you don't go through a season without playing hurt or, or banged up and, you know, at some capacity. You know, it's a lot different now. Uh, I remember, you know, having a, a hamstring strain and, you know, maybe – this ain't the right thing to say, but you know, the needle went in the, in the hamstring and I was able to practice and play, um, had an AC joint, uh, you know, separation, uh, in one of the games that we played, I think it was against the Colts and you know, that again, shots in the shoulder underneath in there with the needle. And, you know, I was able to raise my hands above my head and practice and play. So, you know, it, it's, it's one of those, and I don't advocate for, for people to do that. I, I think, you know, your, your body, you got a lot of years left after you get done playing football. So you got to make sure you're taking care of it. But, you know, but there are going to be, you know, you, you're going to have the soreness you're going to have the bangs. You're going to have the bruise. You're going to have the jam fingers as receivers. You're going to have, you know, ankles that are sore, you know, and things of that nature, ribs that are, that are sore. You know, those are just things you got to play through. And, you know, Buffalo ain't the only team. We weren't the only team doing it. Every single uh, player in the NFL was going through through those uh, those things. That's why it's so important in your off seasons and your training and the regiments and your eating habits and all that to, to prepare yourself. You know, I, I always told everybody I made my money in training camp and, and before the season started. You know, the, the play in the season was was not the gravy, but that was that was the fun part. You make your money before before the game starts. So it's all about preparation. But you know, you're gonna you're gonna deal with that and you're gonna play with it. That's the beauty of, uh, you know, this past stretch for the Bills, uh, winning three games in 11 or 12 days and, you know, a win on a Thursday and <clears throat> getting the three extra days, uh, you know, precious days in a week. Um, but, uh, yeah, Marlon Kerner was on with us last week and um, described in g- grueling detail, according to some of my friends that heard it uh, about getting his knee drained during halftime of, of games to come back when it was swelling up like a balloon, but it was just kind of uh, means to an end to get him through. And then they would deal with it on Monday morning, but, and repeat. Yeah. So Brad, uh, David Questenberry, who played, uh, you know, right tackle the other night uh, or left tackle, sorry, was clearly playing hurt and he was playing on one ankle. And we kind of talked about that uh, after the game on spaces. Like, what what are the guys' reactions when they see in the film room the next day a guy who didn't have the best game, was clearly struggling, but it was also, you know, take kind of taking one for the team. Like like what does that do, you know, for a guy's reputation? Or if you're looking at a guy who's clearly playing hurt because he's, you know, the the only option left, like like what does that do for the locker room? Well, I think that's that's when you start talking about the, the family oriented uh, group of guys that you have it just builds that, Hey, I'm going to do whatever it takes to help this team win. You know, it's not just about me. And, you know, and I think that's where you got to get, you got to get that this, this is not about me. And he was a prime example to say, you know what? Sacrifice, sacrifice my body for this game. Hopefully, you know, uh, Dion will be, dogs will be back next, next week and healed up. But, you know, until he does, I'm, I'm going to give it everything I can. And, uh, you know, you respect guys like that. 
you know, if they don't have another option in there, and he could have easily just said, I, I'm, I, I'm not playing. Uh, I think that makes everybody else around him rally around him for one and rally around the team uh, to get the job done. So, you know, I, re- I respect that out of him. Like you said, maybe not the best game, uh, but, you know, who, who's going to have their best game when they got a, a, a torn up ankle that they can't even put all their weight on uh, just trying to keep somebody off their quarterback. So, you know, kudos to him. And, and I think uh, that just, drives the the intensity level up in the locker room respect for him uh and just more love from the from the players uh, towards him as well yeah I, I couldn't have been more impressed i mean that's a national television game and you're out there on an island as a left tackle and you know a couple times he got beat clean and you know there's memes of him on social media and you know pff gives him a terrible grade and all that but it's that's completely missing the point of what he actually was able to accomplish for the team and be, you know helping them win the game and it's like all, all of that outside noise is is meaningless when 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 you really you know dive into it and, and realize what he actually accomplished just being able to to stay in there till the end of the game yeah and i think it goes to the culture uh that that uh coach mcdermott's is is putting in place there and the kind of character of people that he wants on his team and uh you know i I remember marv levy when we went in our first meeting rooms after i was drafted and he was talking to the group and he said he's i'm just gonna tell you guys you're here because you're self-motivated he says i will not draft a single guy that's not self-motivated if I have to come out here and, and, and pump you up to get you to play football, then you're in the wrong place. I'm not going to do it. And uh, I think Coach McDermott is probably building that same kind of philosophy of these guys love to play the game, and that's what they're there for, and they want to win. And, uh, and you know, he's building a great culture there. And I, and I think that just – that performance there from him just speaks to the culture that he has. That I don't want to let my team down. You know, I'm going to do whatever I got to do to help this team, even though, you know, my bad. And like you said, he's getting these memes. I mean, that's what's so different now, man, uh, about this, these Twitter, Twitter and, you know, everything, social media. I mean, it can be brutal, um, you know, but he, he can look his teammates in the eyes and say, you know what, man, I gave everything I had. And that's what and that's I left it on the field. Yeah. Can you maybe a couple more things before we, we, we go? Did you like did you enjoy winning a game at home or on the road better? All at home, you know, in front of our fans. By by all means, I, I mean that was that was the ultimate to, to be able to win in front of your your home team. Uh, you know, the the away games was nice, uh, but then you had to hop on the plane, fly all the way back. You're getting in at one or two in the morning, you know, and then driving home, you know, getting getting to bed late and getting back up the next morning to go get treatment and all that. So winning at home was always a lot better and and, and more enjoyable. Oh, I think we lost Brad there for a second. Hey, Don, did you like to win more at home or on the road? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I defer to Brad as a player, uh, but um, hey, listen, I, you were in charge of you were in charge of the actual logistics of the road trip. So come on, you you had a you had a stake there. <laughs> my my win happened when everyone showed up for the plane. <laughs> we got everyone there, got them home. But no, there there's something to be said, like where I was in the, in the press box going down to the locker room to, to uh, after a, a road win, you're walking through the concourse and just to, I, for, to see the fans and hear the fans just getting silenced because they're, they're brutal. I mean, uh, some, some stadiums worse than others, but uh, you know, you see them with their head down and you know, Hey, we, we did that. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of nice. It's maybe uh a, a little devious part of humanity that you, you don't want to lean too much into, but um, there's, there's something to be said for uh, being able to silence uh, the other crowd or, or have your team uh, do that to them. Brad, do you have anything else for us before we, uh, we wrap this up or, or Chris? I think I'm good. I appreciate you guys having me on go bills. Looking forward to the rest of this season. Thanks Brad, man. It was great. Yeah. Thank you, Brad. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, everybody, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. And we'll Don and I will be doing this, uh, you know, a, a few more times during the season. Yeah, and make sure you're checking out the If the Walls Could Talk in Buffalo podcast. It's over on Cover One YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks, Chris, everybody. Chris, we enjoy your show too a lot. <laughs> really do.